Hello everyone. Um, we're broadcasting live and our session is beginning now. Uh, it's 5 p.m. in time in Newfoundland and Labrador. So uh, welcome to 5 p.m. our time and whatever time it is uh, in your neck of the woods. Uh, my name is Maggie Payton and I'll be uh, today's chair. Um, but before we begin our session, I'm taking time for us to respectfully acknowledge the province of Newfoundland and Labrador as the ancestral homelands of many diverse peoples of uh, populations of Indigenous people who have contributed to 9,000 years of history, including the Beothic on the island. Today, this province is home to diverse populations of Indigenous and other people. We acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit. I am pleased to be the chair for this workshop. Um, as I said, my name is Maggie Payton and I am the Manager of Settlement Integration and International Student Engagement with the Office of Immigration and Multiculturalism um, with the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, our work engages government and community partners to advance priorities, programs and policies designed to support a positive settlement and integration experience for newcomers to the province. I will be the speaking chair for this session and my colleague Sheldon O'Neill, who has worked to organize this session and will continue to provide background support as needed. Um, so for those of you joining in, um, we will have four presenters this evening um, and you'll see the chat box and the Q&A. Please feel free to ask questions throughout, um, throughout all of the presentations. This workshop highlights an important collaboration between Sharing Our Cultures Incorporated and the Memorial University Center for Social Enterprise. As a long-standing organization in our province, Sharing Our Cultures Incorporated promotes the values of multiculturalism and fosters intercultural respect among newcomers and resident youth. Their impactful gift program engaged youth uh, newcomer youth in establishing a social enterprise with a view to advancing relationships with the Memorial University Center for Social Enterprise along with the broader community. The government of Newfoundland and Labrador is a funding partner for this project. The bios of the individuals involved in our workshop can be found in the speaker section of this workshop. But as a quick overview, um, throughout this presentation, we will hear from Dr. Lodetta Cueco, a Sharing Our Cultures Incorporated founder and CEO. Dr. Cueco will present an overview of the Sharing Our Cultures organization. Sarah Croft with the Memorial University Center for Social Enterprise will share on work experience in the social enterprise program. Emma Matthews, uh, Marketing Communications will impact, with Impactful Gifts program will discuss um, the social enterprise for newcomer youth. And Yasmin Al-Sharif will share her, her her experience as a participant in the program. So not to delay any further, I'm going to throw it over to the wonderful individuals engaged in delivering this program. And we will hear first from Dr. Lodetta Cueco. Take it away, Lodetta. Let me show. OK, I'm really delighted to present our impactful gift, Shana Culture's Social Enterprise, with you. Um, I'll start off with an overview of the presentation itself, following an introduction of what Shana Culture's is what the organization does. I'll talk about the programs. So we have um, several programs in a number of schools and I'll talk about how these programs work and they culminate in the events. So we have events throughout the province. And following that, I'll talk about projects. We've got several projects, but I'll only highlight a few. And I'll conclude the presentation with uh, contacts for our organization in case you needed to get in touch with us. So Cheyenne Cultures is governed by an elected and volunteer board of directors. We also have advisory committees, uh, editorial committee and a youth advisory committee who actually guide the programs and projects that we provide. But just for an overall statement of what Cheyenne Cultures is and what we do, uh, we provide a platform and actually we create spaces for the voices, cultures, histories and experiences of all school children and youth. Initially, when we started out in 1999, they were newcomer youth, uh, but we've since extended that to include uh, youth from indigenous communities, francophone youth and local youth as well. And we want them to be heard, to be seen, to be respected and valued. So Shaina Cultures was established in 1999, following a research study that I conducted 
of the psychosocial needs of new immigrant and refugee school children. We've since actually been referring to them as newcomer school children. And I released the study's findings on March 21. I intentionally chose March 21 because when I interviewed the students for my research, a lot of them spoke about experiencing racism or racially motivated bullying, which is when the bullies uh, actually target newcomer youth or newcomer, newcomer children because they are either learning English as a second language and do not have the vocabulary to report them or that they are just scared uh, being new in a school. And also the fact that they experience unwanted social isolation where they were unable to connect with their school peers and make friends. So when I released the study's findings, I invited representatives from the Department of Education, school administrators, and teachers, and everyone, anyone who had something to do with educating uh, school children and youth in the province. Following the release of my findings, I organized a workshop with the study participants who were in high school, because I realized that there was a greater impact on them connecting with uh, local school youth. And I brought you local youth as well to have an opportunity for them to discuss how they could make school a more welcoming place for newcomer students. And during the workshop, they decided they wanted to do a drama production on integration, which was something that they felt would demonstrate the challenges that newcomer students faced in school. So we were able to put the production together and we performed, the students performed that at the LSPU Hall, which is one of our local uh, theaters here. For that production, we invited teachers to bring in their students. And at the end of the production, the teachers wanted um, to tell us, we asked them to evaluate the production and they said that it was great, they enjoyed it, but they wanted an opportunity for their students to interact with newcomer students. And so we decided on a new format. So instead of a, a performance, we decided we'll have displays of cultures with interaction uh, with the public as well as school children. I do have a three minute um, video here that I'd like to uh, show and uh, which it's always very difficult in words to explain what the China Cultures uh, program is and what we do, but this will give you a bit of an idea. <laughs> Our Shana Cultures is a school approved program that works with high school students to help them develop uh, skills, social skills, academic skills, as well as um, opportunities for teachers who are teaching students about diverse cultures to have an opportunity for an interactive experience with their students. I'd like to say welcome to you all and uh, hope that we will have a wonderful celebration of uh, sharing our cultures. This year, there is a special addition to our celebration, and we have students who are coming actually from Nunavut, who are sharing this day with us. My name is Hayden George. I'm visiting St. John's Newfoundland with a group of uh, 20 students from the Community, and we're here to participate in uh, sharing our cultures event. Greetings from Kuglaktok Nunavut, the westernmost community in Nunavut. We are very grateful to sharing our cultures for organizing this exchange, even though we have traveled more than 5,800 kilometers to be together. My name is Rebecca Shar. I was born and raised in St. John's. I work at the St. John's Native Friendship Center. Um, I've been working there now for 10 years. So today I demonstrated uh, some First Nations hand drum songs, and I also did some demonstration of uh, fancy child dancing. It's so important to keep culture alive, especially for those um, cultures that have unfortunately been lost over time. It's a great way to keep connected and to also educate the, the people around that maybe don't know so much about those cultures. I think it's actually uh, really important to understand the diversity that surrounding us. Um, there's a lot of cultures in our school and a lot of people from different backgrounds. And our cultures is open to the public free of charge. We try to make sure that as many people know about it as possible so that they can come and learn. And through that process of learning, they can find somewhere in their heart to accept diversity and to respect people who are not like them. So we'll come to a place, I think, where 
people will see beyond uh, just what somebody, how somebody looks or how somebody sounds or where someone originated from to seeing what's in the heart. Because, and the final analysis is a heart that we share with each other and we all have the same heart that's beating within us. So it's really important that we keep that focus on acceptance and harmony and respect with each other and peace and love. You never go wrong with those. <laughs> Okay, so um, that's a short video uh, presentation on um, the Sharing Our Cultures event. Um, I'll go on to talk about our programs now. So the Sharing Our Cultures program usually starts from September to May. So after that initial uh, drama performance, I put together a structured program so that students can come together and learn about each other's cultures. So it's free of charge. So all the supplies are provided will be uh, uh, grateful to the government of Newfoundland Labrador and uh, the government of Canada for providing us with the financial assistance that we need to run the program. So the students have weekly meetings to prepare their displays and um, we also collaborate with Memorial University and they provide their international students and some of their staff who will present at the skills development workshops. So the students will meet weekly in their schools and then four times in the year, they would have these workshops over at Memorial University. We found that that was really a good partnership because the high school students are learning from students who are some of them from their own cultures who are already in uh, university. And it helps them, they're mentored by these facilitators who help them to see the importance and the significance of post-secondary education. And we find out as uh, participate in the program, they develop a sense of place and a sense of belonging. They also develop friendships because we are in several schools in the city. And so when we bring them all together, they realize that, oh, there's someone from my culture or someone who speaks my language that's in another school. And of course, through social media, they're able to connect again. And we found out that with the Sharing Our Cultures program in the schools, it um, helps to eliminate unwanted social isolation as well as um, providing volunteer experience for the students and uh, community engagement um, at the events. So now the events. Uh, the events um, are held um, every year. So the students will work from uh, September on their displays and then they will present that at the rooms in St. John's. And we always have it around March 21, which is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. But within the past uh, two years, it, uh, March has become Multiculturalism Month for the province of Newfoundland Labrador. So the high school students will share their cultures. As you can see, Maya in the photograph is uh, sharing in, with some grade six students who usually visit the event. So we bring in about 200 grade six students per session and we divide them into small groups of six to eight and we provide them with uh, bilingual tour guides. So the program itself, the event is held in both official uh, languages. So the bilingual tour guides, their role is to um, summarize if the teachers want their grade six students to interact in French and the presenter, uh, the high school cultural presenter presents in English, then the bilingual tour guides will summarize the uh, presentation and uh, help the students with their passports. So every student comes in with their individual passports where they can write information about what they learned to take back to the classroom. And we also have activities for the students to do in the classroom with the teachers. This intercultural and experiential learning uh, program complements the grade six curriculum outcomes for the province for social studies, language arts, uh, religious education, uh, as well as English and French languages. Um, in 2018, we expanded uh, the Sharing Our Cultures program to all regions of the province. And uh, so currently, Sharing Our Cultures is held in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Conabrook, Gander. Grand Falls, Windsor also took in some of the students from uh, Con River. And this is in addition to St. John's. I have a two and a half minute video of that expansion uh, when it was um, the first time at uh, Connerbrook, and uh, this is a video on that. So 
sharing our cultures originated 20 years ago in 1999 in St. John's. 20 years later in 2019, here we are. It's been spread across Newfoundland, Labrador, and we are very happy to have sharing our cultures here at Cornerbrook Regional High today. wonderful cultures here and countries. The kids love expressing themselves given the opportunity. We have performances from some of our students. Then they had their own little dance party at the end of the event where they so proudly dressed themselves in their flags, intermingled and had a good time. We've had a lot of fun. We've painted, we've decorated, we've made a big mess and the students got to know each other really well and I got to know the students really well too. And we have booths here today showing all of the beautiful elements of these cultures. The students from all these different countries have shared their cultures with grade six students and they have so many positive things to share with our students. They had passports and what they had to do was they had to go to visit all of these different countries and they had to ask questions, read from the display booths, and record answers in their passports. The passports are then brought back to their classes and they achieve marks for their work here today. So all of the kids that I spoke to had a really, really fun time today and our international students really enjoy themselves as well. Those videos uh, were taken prior to COVID, so that's why the students there and the people were not wearing masks. I'll uh, quickly run through the projects that we um, uh, organize. So we have Cultural Context, it's a publication where grade six students write stories about their cultures and poems and drawings, and uh, we distribute this to all grade six students in the province. It's supposed to, it was designed actually to stimulate conversation about cultural diversity in classrooms and homes because every grade six student gets an opportunity to take it home and talk with their parents about the cultures of the students who have um, published in the publication. So cultural context enhances the literacy, literary and artistic skills of the students. And a multicultural classroom program, we uh, started that program because we realized when the grade six students come to the event, it's colorful, there's lots of sounds and so much is going on that we figured that they were not really getting the deep learning we wanted them to get out of it. So we um, started the multicultural classroom activities program where we had a coordinator would go into the schools and the classroom and have six sessions. So they'd learn about culture and environment, culture and uh, uh, expressions, culture and human rights. So they, they actually have enough opportunity to think about culture and to have actually have a more intensive and interactive learning experience. Um, a final project I'll talk to you about is a exchange program between the school youth in Kugluktuk. So we brought some students from Kugluktuk Nunavut to St. John's and they were able to experience the the culture here in the shopping malls and movie theaters, because in the small hamlet in Kugluktuk, they didn't have that as part of their culture. And the students in St. John's, of course, went over. So we had students from India, from Iraq, from Syria, from Sudan, from the Congo. So they went there and they had to do everything else that the students uh, did. They learned how to build an igloo and how to ice fish. And both students had opportunities to be in the classroom with their matching students. And even up to recently, these students were communicating between each other. And um, it, we, we felt that it built positive relationships between indigenous and newcomer school youth, because sometimes newcomers, newcomer students come and they don't always know the history of indigenous peoples in Canada. And uh, the indigenous uh, students who were living in Kugluktuk do not have the opportunity to interact with students from diverse cultural backgrounds. A project, the Legacy Hooked Rug, we decided we would have some, just some young people come together to learn the Newfoundland art of rug hooking. 
we were meeting every couple of weeks and then we realized that they wanted to meet every week and then they wanted to meet every day. Uh, so we, we found that, that these young people had barriers to gaining employment. They either did not have work experience, uh, they didn't have Canadian work experience, they didn't have any employability skills. So we met with them pretty much four times a week and uh, they were able to develop friendships at the end of the project. So the red dots and the map of the world indicates the um, countries and cultures um, that had participated in China cultures between 1999 and 2019. And that, of course, leads us into our social enterprise. We then realized that um, there were a cohort of youth who needed employability skills and Canadian work experience. And we also wanted to give back to the community. So the um, uh, government of Newfoundland Labrador to the Department of Immigration, Population Growth and Skills provided us with the startup funds um, for the impactful gifts. Actually, someone from our uh, strategic planning uh, that we had back in November 2020, Margarita suggested, why don't we make uh, reusable bags? So we sort of went with that idea and with the startup funds, we were able to hire a sewing instructor to teach them about that. And we also um, had the support of Noir University Center for Social Enterprise and Entrepreneurship. They helped us with um, uh, finding um, a work term students. So, they subsidized the wages for a work term student in the winter who came and helped us with a business plan, uh, helped us how we could set, set it up. And then for the spring and summer, we had another work term student, uh, Emma Matthews, that you'll meet later on. And uh, so how uh, uh, wages were also subsidized. So just the interaction we had between the Center for Social Enterprise and Entrepreneurship was really helpful to us because it was the first time we were studying a social enterprise and we felt that Emma was she was over and beyond uh, expectations she uh, had a good rapport with the students they enjoyed having her she made them feel welcome in the space as they learned you know to sew and learned other activities throughout the workshop so uh, Emma completed her work term and we couldn't let her go so we uh, hired her part-time while she's in school to uh, work with China cultures and these are the um, uh, contributors financially and in kind who support the China Cultures program and these are our contacts. So thank you very much. Thank you Lloyd, that is wonderful information. I'm sure the audience will have lots of questions about what you've discussed and presented here. Uh, next we'll hear from Sarah Kraft, the Memorial University Center for Social Enterprise and Entrepreneurship. Hi everyone, I am Sarah Kraft, the Program and Student Engagement Coordinator at the Center for Social Enterprise at Memorial University of Newfoundland. I'm really excited to be a part of this panel discussion today. Loidetta, that was a wonderful presentation. All right, so here's a quick slide on our small but mighty team at the center. So to the left is the acting manager, Dr. Jillian Morrissey, and there's me to the right. So to give you a really quick background on who I am, I am a commerce graduate from Memorial University. I started in this role at the center in January of 2020, although I've been working with the center on and off since 2017. So my current role includes developing and delivering programs, creating inclusive experiential learning opportunities, uh, for students, as well as coordinating student-focused events, getting to connect with organizations that are working towards making a positive impact has been such an amazing experience for me, including my connection with Loideta and sharing our cultures. So I'm joining you today to talk about a program that we offer at the Center that resulted in our partnership with Sharing Our Cultures on their Impactful Gifts Social Enterprise. This program helps support social enterprises in Newfoundland and Labrador by providing them with a wage subsidy. But before I dig into that, I'm gonna give you a really quick background on the Center for Social Enterprise and what we do overall. So the center is built on a unique collaboration between the Faculty of Business, the School of Social Work and the School of Music at Memorial University. 
The center launched in 2017 and has established itself as a hub of social enterprise activity. So what we do is work to strengthen social enterprises. So we're a support for social enterprises, whether it's providing resources or connecting people to others in our network. Uh, we also encourage social entrepreneurs, and this includes helping support new student social entrepreneurs. So if an individual has questions about starting or growing their social enterprise, they can come to us. We also have an incubator program for student social entrepreneurs, so we can help them develop and grow their ventures. We provide them with office space with $2,500 to $7,500 in funding, business advisors, uh, workshops and trainings, and other related resources. And lastly, we create employment for students through our work experience in social enterprise program. And this is the main piece that I will be speaking on today. As, a, as I said, it relates to our partnership with sharing our cultures and impactful gifts. So before I go further into that, I'm gonna quickly walk everyone through the meaning of social enterprise in case there are people listening who are not quite familiar with the term. So social enterprise is a way of doing business that challenges our understanding of wealth at the expense of people and the planet. So social enterprises identify, evaluate, and exploit opportunities to create social value. So they create jobs and they generate income like other businesses, but they reinvest their profits to support a social, cultural, or environmental mission just as sharing our cultures has been doing. They're a wonderful example. So I was connected with Lloyd Detta in 2020, and we were learning all about sharing our cultures and the interesting plans that they had in the works, such as impactful gifts. And we realized that they would be a perfect fit for our work experience in social enterprise program. And so when we first were speaking, well, Adetta was in the ideation phase, if I remember cor correctly, and she was looking for support to get this idea up and off the ground. And one way we could see the center coming into play was by supporting a student to work with sharing our cultures and help make this happen. So our work experience in social enterprise program gives students of all disciplines at Memorial University hands-on experience in social enterprise and it provides opportunities to develop their skills, build their resume, and so much more. And how it works is we partner with social enterprises in this province who need support in a wide variety of areas, such as marketing, research, um, business planning, accounting. There's a huge variety. And we create paid full-time and part-time placements. And so the students go on the social enterprises payroll, so they administer the wage to the student up front, and the center provides a wage subsidy to help cover that placement. And so this wage subsidy is reimbursed to, um, to the social enterprise, sorry, either bi-weekly, monthly, or one full reimbursement at the end of the placement. And something that we have learned through the pandemic is that we can make these placements possible remotely if in-person cannot be an option. And so this program is a great opportunity for social enterprises like Impactful Gifts to receive support from students while also providing students with experience and skills development. It enables students to contribute while developing skills, personal growth, um, and and learning more about the social challenges that exist around us. And international students also benefit from the Canadian work experience by building professional networks and, of course, embedding themselves in the community. Uh, we also, quickly, I'll talk about our partnership with MyTax on some of our placements. So MyTax is a national not-for-profit organization that builds partnerships that support industrial and social innovation in Canada, and they are committed to supporting research-based innovation while working closely with partners in industry, academia, and government. And MyTex offers a business strategy internship that Sharing Our Cultures received approval on for their very first student placement, uh, which was also through us. 
So how it worked was the center contributed some money sharing our cultures, made a contribution, and then MyTax matched that to create uh, a paid four month placement. And that was in the winter of 2021. And so this student position helped sharing our cultures develop the social enterprise business plan for their social enterprise. And this included tasks like conducting market research, uh, performing a SWOT analysis, researching marketing strategies, and to help with the development of their so uh, summer program to teach sewing and employability skills. And so after the great success of this placement, Lodetta reached out and requested support from another student. And this placement was through our wage subsidy that I had mentioned previously. And the student hired was the wonderful Emma Matthews, who is here with us today. And we'll be speaking now shortly on her experience. Uh, so yeah, that's actually everything that I have on the Center for Social Enterprise and our partnership with Sharing Our Cultures and Impactful Gifts. I'm just gonna finish off by saying that if there is a silver lining, it is that this public health crisis has highlighted the immense value of social enterprise as a means of healthy, resilient populations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Great overview and, and great tie into our thinking about um, COVID-19 and, and how we need to look for the different and innovative solutions as we move forward. Um, so now I'm going to go to Emma, Emma Matthews, you've been spoken of very highly so far. So let's hear about your uh, involvement with this program, Impactful Gifts. Hi, everyone. So um, thank you so much, Sarah and Lloydetta, for your wonderful presentations. It was so nice to hear from you guys. And thank you to Maggie for sharing this today. Um, I'm so honored to be here on behalf of Sharing Our Cultures. And I'm just going to kind of run over with you guys what our program is really all about. So like Sarah mentioned, I was employed through this program through a Memorial University co-op program. And my role in this position was to kind of deal with the marketing side of things. So when I first joined up with this organization, the social enterprise was in a startup phase. So we kind of just had to work through that and that kind of brought us to where we are now. So this presentation is gonna kind of take you right from the start to where we are now. So yeah, I hope you guys all enjoy. So first I wanted to talk about the three key phases upon the startup of this program. So the first thing that we had to kind of do was obviously find students that we could recruit to join our social enterprise. So just to kind of get into what the actual social enterprise is, um, basically we saw a gap for newcomer students finding jobs here. I mean, a lot of them come here and they may not have Canadian citizenship right away. Um, they don't have resumes, they may have never had a job before, so a lot of them lack those skills to get them a job. So we kind of wanted to create something that would find that gap and, you know, give them something, give them something to get involved with. So to recruit students, we started off by emailing a lot of high school teachers because we were looking for students aged 15 to 21. So we reached out to high school teachers and asked if they could advertise to their classrooms. And from here, we had upward of 10 students register. So that was really great. Um, we had all the students come into our office space and we kind of got their availability scheduling so I could create a plan for when to get them into our office and start right away. So this was in May that we first launched our workshop and our first workshop went from May to August. And then we had our next cohort of students which started in September and are still with us now. So after I made a schedule for all of the students, um, I kind of had to work through the COVID-19 guidelines, of course. So at this time, students were actually in school on alternating days. They were there like maybe one Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, the next week. So something that was a bit of a challenge was aligning their schedules with the Metro bus passes because we did provide our students with a bus pass so they could have every opportunity to, you know, make it to our workshop. A lot of them don't have transportation. So that was something else we had to deal with. So yeah, we just created a schedule that would kind of also adhere to the COVID-19 guidelines. So it would allow some of the students to come on alternating days so we would be able to social distance in our workshop. So it kind of separated them into two groups and then we went from there. So yeah, this kind of brings us into our workshop curriculum. So I know that 
um, Lloyd Dada and Sarah mentioned that our workshop is basically about sewing bags. So basically what our idea was is we have the students come in and we teach them how to sew. A lot of them don't have prior sewing experience. So we start right from the beginning and we give them all the tools and the skills that they could eventually sew these beautiful bags. And what we're hoping to do is fill these bags with um, locally sourced products eventually and sell them as kind of a gift bag. So people can purchase the bag and there's items inside and you can have it for yourself, give it as a gift. So yeah, that's kind of our idea. So the first step was to hire a sewing instructor, which we did by putting out some advertisements and conducting some interviews. And then we found some great candidates and hired our lovely sewing instructor from there. So she just taught all of the students how to sew and that really gave them a lot of confidence. A lot of them um, never sewed before, like I said. So just learning that new skill was really fun for a lot of them. It was great to see how well they took onto it. So that was awesome. Um, we also had to acquire materials, of course. So before just going out and purchasing a bunch of fabric, we wanted to see if we could maybe get any donations. So I reached out to some local sewing fabric stores here and asked if they had anything they would like to donate. And we actually had a lovely lady donate a lot of fabric to us and a lot of threads, which we are still using to this day. So shout out to her. I don't know if she's on here listening, but that was just amazing because this fabric was essentially going to be wasted before, just thrown in the garbage. So we kind of took that fabric and repurposed it into something else. So that was also really great. So yeah, also in terms of acquiring materials, we had to make sure that we purchased enough so each student could have their own because with COVID-19, we couldn't really let them share stuff for sanitary reasons. So that was something else we had to kind of plan for and write out a list of all the necessary things we would need because we didn't have any sewing supplies prior to this. So we got all the materials, uh, sewing machines, everything, so the students could have all of their own stuff. And yeah, that's kind of the curriculum. So next I want to talk about what I think is one of the most important pieces of this, which is the student benefits. So like I mentioned, um, our main goal was to teach the students how to sew for the social enterprise. So they'll sew bags and then we'll sell the bags to the public and the profits from those bags will go directly to these students as well as back into the community. So what I noticed upon working here was um, a lot of students came here and they felt really isolated when they first came here. Maybe the activities that they would do in their home country aren't the same as here. Um, it's a huge culture shock alone. And yeah, they just didn't really have any activities to you know, be involved in. So we kind of wanted to make this space a place where students could come in and just kind of felt like somewhere they belonged, like, you know, just somewhere that they could go after school, kind of unwind and just talk about their day, do some sewing, you know, just a casual environment. So that was really great for a lot of the students because I noticed um, over the months that they were coming in, their confidence was significantly increased from the beginning to the end. They were talking so much more on um, their English skills really improved. So that was one of the great benefits, just, you know, coming in and having a conversation with me every day. It makes such a big difference, like you wouldn't think. But yeah, a lot of them don't speak English at home because they're speaking their native language with their family. So they don't even get the chance to practice English all that much. So another benefit that um, we that this program offers our students is gaining employability skills. So. Not only did we teach them sewing throughout the summer, but we also had some people come in from different organizations that did workshops with them, which included um, resume writing, employability skills, technology skills, online safety, social media, all those kind of things. So there's what I really noticed was there's things that are just second nature to a lot of us that that's not for them. I mean, they've come from across the world, maybe, and things that we take for granted every day, these students need help with. So that's kind of where we came into play and just said, okay, we want to give them the one-on-one -on -one that they need and really kind of get them integrated into the community and, you know, give them the foundation they need to succeed because these students are our future generation of workers like myself. So it's really important that we give them all of the tools to excel because they're all so bright and yeah. Um, another thing I wanted to touch on was just the teamwork that they got to do when they were in the workshop. So like I said, we had students from all different high schools, so it was really nice to bring them all together and they could kind of 
you know, get to know each other, build friendships. Um, they had things that they could bond over, connect over. So that was really great, just putting them in that environment and giving them some teamwork skills. And yeah. So that brings me to our social enterprise in action. So of course, like I mentioned all summer, we had our students sewing and doing some other cool things. So then once we had enough bags made, it was time to actually launch our product. So we've reached out to some local places in town that, was, that would maybe be interested in hosting us. And we ended up going to the Kitty Vitty Plantation which for those of you who aren't familiar, it's an art studio here in St. John's that kind of lets local people display their work. So we went there and we also went to the farmer's market here and we had really great success with that. Um, I created some social medias for impactful gifts. I'll mention those at the end to, you know, kind of advertise to the public as well as maybe students that would be interested in joining our program. So that's the social media piece of it. And something else that happened during all this was, um, like I mentioned, we were paying the students for the bags they were sewing. So we had to help them make bank accounts because a lot of them didn't have their own bank account and couldn't receive payment. So we got to take them to the bank and help them set up their own bank account, which was really awesome. Um, it gave them, you know, a sense of independence, um, sense of accomplishment. So that was awesome. And yeah. They also got to help us sell the bags at the Kitty Vitty Plantation and the Farmer's Market. So we took a few of the students with us that wanted to come along for the day and they got to help us sell the bags to the public. So they got to interact with the public on a professional level, as well as learn how to work the payment machine. So those were all just some great skills that they got to acquire over the entirety of this workshop. So that brings us to where we are now. So, um, we have a wonderful steering committee that we meet with every week, the Impactful Gifts Steering Committee. So shout out to you guys. I know some of you are on here listening and I just wanted to say, we're so appreciative of everything you guys do for us. So basically every week we all kind of get together and just talk about, talk about what's going on, kind of collaborate ideas, bounce ideas off of each other, see what the next step is. And yeah, they're, they're so great and I don't know what we would do without them. So. That's an important piece. Um, also, the graduation ceremony. So after we have our group of students um, complete the workshop over the three or four months, we host a little graduation ceremony for them at the end. So we allowed them all to take in one family member just due to COVID guidelines and stuff. And we printed off some certificates and we had a minister come in and present them with their awards. So that was super awesome to experience because um, a lot of the students never had a sort of graduation ceremony like that for themselves. They had never been, they'd never been rewarded like that or honored like that. So that was so awesome. They worked so hard all summer and was so deserved. So yeah, um, with our workshop now, like I mentioned earlier, we had students that began with us in September that are still with us now. So we've kind of moved on from doing just sewing to more of a half and half um, homework, half sewing. Because what I was finding was that a lot of the students would come in after school and they would want to do their homework. They had homework that they couldn't finish in school. So I'm like, okay, let's let's get out your homework first to get that done. Um, but what I didn't realize is that a lot of them don't get that one-on-one -on -one in school that they really need. Um, their English, a lot of them, their English skills aren't fully there yet. They're still learning. so. For them alone to go into a classroom with 30 odd students and be expected to keep up with the curriculum and understand everything the teacher is saying and then get their work done on time it's it's it can be a lot so it's so nice that they can come to our office and i can help them with their work and give them that one-on-one -on -one that they maybe don't really get in school so yeah that's something that we were kind of we've kind of changed since we first started and i think it's really great i mean the students are asking me every day oh can we come back tomorrow can we come back tomorrow so like it's just so great to see that they're really taking to it and that they really enjoy it so yeah i just wanted to last talk about the personal impact um this has had on me so um, I really can't speak enough on how much this social enterprise has changed my life. Um, I never, I never thought before that I really would like to work like with students or in like a school like environment, but I've just grown so close to every single student that's walked in the door. Um, 
I can't speak enough about all of them. They're really just such amazing people and they have so much potential. So it's, I just think it's so great that I get to go in there and, you know, kind of help them see their full potential and give them that confidence so that they can go out in the real world and eventually find a job, you know? A lot of them came in, they were super quiet at first. Um, they don't have a lot to say. They don't have, they don't have a lot to do. And then towards the end of it, they come in and it's like, can't get them out the door. They, they don't want to leave. It's so amazing. And something else that I think is really great is considering I'm also a student, I'm not too far off in age with a lot of them. So I feel like I can really connect with them on a, a deeper personal level. I don't really want to go in there and be like a teacher and be like an authoritative figure to them. I want to more so be a role model, someone they can look up to and say, hey, I want to go to university one day like, like she did, you know? So like I'm kind of their friend, I'm also their workshop instructor but you know it's it's just it's just so great and i'm so appreciative for all the time i get to spend with them so yeah thank you all so much for listening i know that was a lot of information to take in but i hope you all got something out of it and if you wanted to check out our impactful gifts instagram i have it written there on the slide and i just wanted to give a huge huge shout out to loidetta because Without her, none of this would be happening. None of this would be possible. And she is honestly the best person on the planet. She is a heart of gold and she would just do absolutely anything for anyone. So huge shout out to Loidetta and the rest of my team. And I really hope you guys got something out of this. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Emma. And it's so great to hear the personal impact that these types of projects can have when, you, when you're engaged on them in a pro professional level. There's also, of course, going to be the human component, which is why we're all doing, doing the work that we do. Um, and last but certainly not least, we are going to hear from Yasmin Al-Sharif. And Yasmin was a participant in this program. So Yasmin, over to you. Thank you, Maggie. I don't have a PowerPoint to present, but good afternoon, everybody. My name is Yasmin Al Sharif, and I'm a grade 10 student at a Holy High and Mary High School in St. John's, Newfoundland. I'm from Homs in Syria. I was born in Syria and moved with my parents when I was four years old. I lived in Lebanon most of my life because of the war that happened in Syria. I lived in Lebanon for eight years until I moved to St. John's, 2016. I really enjoy going on walks and I really like to write. That's why writing is my favorite subject. This summer, my aunt told me about the Sharing Our Culture Impactful Gifts program. She told me how it was a good program that would teach me how to sew and I would get paid and meet new friends. She told me to come and check it out. I came. Can you guess what happened next? And I stayed. I was expecting a lot of people and a huge crowd and many machines. But when I got there, there was only a few people. It made me want to stay because back then I was very shy. After a few days, I started meeting new people and talking to them, which made me really want to stay. I had no experience with sewing. I learned different parts of a sewing machine and then I learned how to use the machine. The first thing I made was a mask. The sewing instructor said that I was good at following the lines and I started sewing reusable and reversible bags. And I was really good at it. I started getting faster and making the bags. And I was the fastest sewer in the program. I made over 100 good quality bags. Each bag had a tag with the name of the student who made it. The sewing instructor was very nice and helped me a lot. Without it, I wouldn't have been able to learn how to sew. She was helpful and fun and made jokes. So our time together was never boring. Emma, our project coordinator, was like a friend to us and pretty funny. She would come around and ask if we wanted anything like water or snacks and made sure that we were comfortable and had enough to eat and drink. When we were bored, she would come and talk to us. And when our sewing instructor was not around, she would help us with our sewing. It was really fun to be around her. Emma organized workshops for us to learn other skills. At times, someone came in to talk about writing resumes and cover letters. He told us about the things we should put and things we shouldn't put on our resumes. We also learned about internet safety, social media, and apps you shouldn't go, down, you shouldn't go to or download. 
such as the Black Web. Another time, someone came to talk to us about the benefits of the community centers that are in different places in the city. These centers have free services and support available. They can help us with searching for jobs, information about education and scholarship, online applications, and career services. In the Impactful Gifts program, I learned how to communicate with others. If I hadn't joined, I wouldn't have the courage to, to present today. In this program, I met new people who are now my friends. At the Kitty Vitty Village, where we sold bags, I learned how to use the cash machine and promote the bags to the people who visited the village. I also interacted with the customers and improved my communication skills. This was my first job in Canada, and I learned a lot of experience. I can now put on my resume. This experience will help me as I further my education and go to university. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. It's so wonderful to, to hear your experience. And uh, I'm just so happy that you were all able to share this evening. Um, for those of you listening, I'll remind you to feel free to put your questions in the Q&A on the side. Um, before we get into that, I think I'll just <clears throat> I'll go off some of these kind of inspirational things we're hearing. And, and I think some of the individuals tuning in are very inspired by what, what they're hearing today. Um, moments of, you know, the wonderful thing about projects like this is that, you know, they, they go beyond what the original need might have been or what your original, original involvement you thought might look like. Um, so I'll, I'll offer this to anyone who'd like to answer it before we get into the Q&A to give people a moment to write some questions. Um, is what was, you know, perhaps the best personal moment in this project? And, and Emma, you kind of spoke to some of this, but, but for Laudetta and for Sarah, if you'd like to answer, like to answer that question, um, the floor is yours. Okay, I can go ahead. I think uh, my best moment was um, when I think I'd come into the office. It was around nine o'clock and one of the students showed up at the door and they weren't supposed to start till one because we thought during the summer they might want to sleep in and come in and uh, have the program from one to four. And of course I went to the door and there was Yasmin uh, saying, I, I said, what are you doing here? I thought, you know, so early, nine o'clock in the morning, I thought you were probably going on an appointment and was just dropping by to see what we're doing. No, she says to me, I've come to sew. <laughs> so that was my best moment. I was thinking, there she is, a teenager at the whole, you know, school holiday on a weekday. And at nine o'clock, she was at her office wanting to sew. So that was just so exciting. And uh, yeah, that was one of my, one of my real great, great moments. I just uh, touched my heart. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing, Sarah. Is there anything you'd like to speak to? Yeah, for me is the the connection piece. You know, having the opportunity to meet Loidetta and Margarita and Emma and now Yasmin, it's just wonderful to hear and it's just so exciting to see the work that you're doing and being there from the beginning when you had this idea of impactful gifts and now seeing how far it has come. It's it's incredible. That's great. Um, <clears throat> so we have a question from the audience. Um, why are initiatives for sharing our cultures directed toward younger populations such as high school students? What about immigrants who come to Canada at a later age, for example, adults or older adults? Okay, I guess that's a question for me to answer. Yeah, you can go um, ahead and I can yeah. and I can answer from a provincial perspective too, Lordetta, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, we do have a settlement agency here that actually looks after the adults when they come. And at the beginning of Shaina Cultures, um, my research area is actually with children and education, school children, education, belonging, acculturation. So when I realized that um, there were uh, students in school who were not receiving, the, you know, uh, they were struggling or had challenges i felt that that's where we needed to go and we've just been filling the gaps ever since so there hadn't been a need to look into providing services for adults although having said that sometimes the children's um, parents have needs and we've uh, sharing our cultures has, has gone out of the way to meet those needs myself personally but other members of um, our board or community community here 
Um, so that's, uh, uh, we've sort of just had the focus of school children and when we realize that um, learning about cultural diversity and trying to eliminate racism, we figure if we can work with students in the schools at that young age, then we can actually maybe change their, their minds and their way of thinking and their behaviors towards um, newcomers and probably develop that uh, sense of acceptance of diversity and people from all cultures. So. I think that's primarily why Shana cultures us stay. And I just love working with the children at the youth. <laughs> this is where we've primarily stayed with that uh, uh, age group for that demographics, yeah. Absolutely, thank you for, for sharing that, Lordetta. And, and importantly too, I think for the audience to know, sharing our cultures really does become um, a family event, you know, at, at the public event at the end and for many of the newcomer uh, youth, it's a great way to introduce their parents to, to different cultures around the world too. So it really is um, a beautiful event um, here locally in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, from a provincial perspective, so this is one of the projects that we fund, but we do fund projects that, that work with adults and older adults. We have multiculturalism grants, we support settlement services, um, and we have a main uh, settlement service provider. So Sharon Cultures is, is a wonderful organization of, of many that does this, but they're very much supportive of kind of that educational component that Odetta mentioned, so it's very valuable programming as well. Um, Another question we have, um, why was sewing chosen as the activity of the social enterprise rather than any other activity? I can speak on that for, um, I know that when I first um, joined with Sharing Our Cultures, they already had the idea for impactful gifts, so they kind of already had decided on sewing, but I know that one of the main reasons was because plastic bags were becoming obsolete, so there was a need for a reusable bag. And also, I know that sewing is just an important skill. Um, it's a skill you can carry with you for your whole life. So we kind of just wanted to try that out. And we also had the idea of making it into a gift bag. So that's where the name Impactful Gifts came from, to incorporate local items. So supporting the community by putting their local items in our bags, which were sewn by the newcomer students, providing them a job opportunity, and then, yeah, kind of just bringing the community together. So that is definitely one of the reasons why sewing was chosen. I'm not sure if Lloydetta has something she wants to add to that, because that's as far as I know. Yeah, you know everything that I know, Emma, about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, that, and, that's, and that's wonderful. Um, just thinking about, you know, the Emma mentioned uh, students getting a bank account or um, the homework support. Um, what were some additional indirect benefits stemming from this program that you could note? And that's for anyone who'd like who'd like to answer, because I think that everybody had had some engagement with that. Well, I think as Yasmin said, if I can answer that, she gained the confidence. Like I mean, she mentioned that she was kind of shy, and uh, then of course she was like. A special speaker during the graduation ceremony and uh, so she felt that if she hadn't been in the program she would not have developed that confidence that level of you know comfort with the language to be able to speak uh, to an audience and uh, which did I think that's uh, one one benefit uh, I don't know Yasmin if you think of others <laughs> other than that um. So I think we can we can also think about the social enterprise component of this. So Sarah, from from your perspective and 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 for the audience here, you know what's what's a good measurement of success for for a social enterprise, or or what's some advice you you might offer people who will be looking to do a similar collaboration across the country? Yeah, absolutely. So social enterprise is one of those terms. It's tricky because it's so open and it can differ from province to province um, or depending on where you're to in the world. Um, so some of the important key things is making sure that you can become financially sustainable uh, within this business and whatever it is that you're working towards, it should be something that you're passionate about. Having that passion makes a huge, a huge difference. And so when you become financially sustainable, then majority of your profits will then go towards supporting that, that passion area 
for you. And, and I think it's, it's easy to see that Loidetta's passion area was, is this, and, and, you know, it's, yeah, it's one of those challenging, but exciting topics, social enterprise. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I guess one of the other remaining questions, and I've been thinking about this was, you know, do you think this project would have looked differently um, without COVID-19 restrictions? And, and for those listening, um, COVID-19 impacted um, every province, of course, in our country, but looked a little bit in different in Newfoundland and Labrador in terms of restrictions at, cert at certain points throughout 2020 and 2021, and as we move into 2022. Um, so I think Sarah, you brought up, you know, the sustainability piece um, and, and looking towards social enterprises as we move forward in recovery from, from COVID-19. Um, and Emma, you mentioned, you know, some of the restrictions around having participants in the room and, and thinking about that. So how do you envision, um, or I guess, what was the impact of COVID-19 on these projects, on this project? I would say for us, um, probably one of the biggest impacts was basically just not being able to have in as many students as we would have liked to have. But I also think in a way that was a bit of a blessing in disguise because that kind of meant we had more time with less students. So I really got the chance to get really close with all the students. We would only have five or six of them max at a time. So usually it would be four or five. So that really gave me the chance to go around and not only did the students learn from us, but I got to learn so much from them. And, you know, it's really important to ask them questions about their culture, ask them from the, ask them about their home. They love talking about that. They love telling you stories and telling you about their language and the foods that they eat. So I feel like in a way, COVID-19 kind of got to bring us closer because we weren't able to have as many of them in there at a time as we would have liked to have, but in a way it was really nice because we got to get really close. Great, it's, it's so, so nice to hear such a positive spin on, on such a challenging period. Um, it's refreshing. Um, any discussions, so maybe this is for Ledet or Emma, around the expansion of products? So right now you're doing bags, what, what might the future look like? Or maybe those conversations aren't happening yet. <laughs> Oh no, they're, um, they're happening. <clears throat> well, in addition to the bags, the students did learn how to make um, masks and scrunchies and um, the sewing instructor has started showing them they wanted to learn how to make t-shirts. Oh, so great. we started learning, making t-shirts for them. Because we found actually <clears throat> when we, we started and the students were learning to sew, if they made something for themselves, they were really excited about it. So they went home, went to school, I made my own mask or, you know, I made my own bag. Or, so we've been trying to, in, in as much as we're making some things for our own social enterprise, we're really thinking, seeing that the importance of the students making something for themselves, something that, you know, they may not have been able to have an opportunity. They don't have a sewing machine at home, so they couldn't sew themselves anything. But by coming here, they can make something for themselves so they can take home. And so they've been learning other things, sewing other things other than bags. But we're also hoping that um, as time goes on, we will, the products that we want to put into the bags, the students could actually make those, um, you know, whatever they plan that they're going to make. So that could go into the bags as well. Um, you know, yeah, so so we are, we are planning <laughs> for, for different, um, yeah, we have different ideas that we could use with the bags and, um, I don't know if Emma wants to speak to the recipe piece of what we would like to do going forward. Yeah, sure. I'll just briefly touch on that. So like Loidetta mentioned, and I mentioned in my presentation, we do want to fill the bags with something. So obviously you can purchase the bag on its own, but we kind of wanted to make it a gift idea so you could purchase it and maybe give it as a gift. So like she said, we have the students sewing smaller things like masks, scrunchies, um, pencil kits, just small things like that that we can incorporate into the bags. We also have this really cool idea of making it kind of like a recipe bag. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen before like those little like hot chocolate things. It comes with a tube of hot chocolate powder and then marshmallows or whatever else you need. So it's kind of like that except for completely different. And by, that, <laughs> by that I mean, we wanted to get the students involved by um, getting them to share a recipe from their culture, from their hometown, and we want to see if we can get it to a recipe that doesn't require too many, um, too many um, 
things that could like go bad, you know, produce and stuff like that, more so products that we could have in the bag. And then we could provide a little recipe in the bag and provide them with all of the ingredients to make that dish. So you're kind of getting to experience their culture um, in your own home. And it's also kind of a fun idea. I mean, I personally love cooking and baking. I'm sure a lot of people do. So you kind of get to give that as a gift and then you can do something with it. And on top of that, it's we would like to incorporate the student by sharing the student who shared this recipe, who made this bag, and just kind of tie it all together to create an experience. So yeah, that's where we're planning on going in the future. That sounds wonderful. And I know people love to connect over food. I think that's a, that's definitely a good cross-cultural connection. <laughs> um, Yasmin, so you mentioned how this project really inspired you in your future learning and going to university. So how, how did it encourage you for your plans for future education or thoughts? You know, are you going to do business? What, what, do you have any plans for your future? What would you like to study in university? Quite a lot of stuff. <laughs> well, I haven't made the decision yet. I don't know. But it does, like, this program inspires me to basically be like Emma. She inspires me. <laughs> that is, that's so wonderful to hear. And you can tell, um, kind of watching how you speak about each other and, and, and with each other. Um, I don't know if the audience is understanding this well, but I'm seeing it's definitely, there's so much um, connection that was created amongst the participants and then amongst the individuals who, who provided this program. So I think that that's, that's one of those, you know, extra benefits that sometimes you don't, don't anticipate is the connection that you've created amongst each other and, and how that will support your confidence, as you mentioned, going forward, but, but support other connections. Right now you have a, a connection to Emma and a, and a wonderful role model in, in someone you might not have met otherwise. So I think that that's, that's great to, to inspire each other as it really sounds like this project is one that uh, creates inspiration on all levels. Um, just so, just thinking about the time, so it's, you know, we have about five, five, seven minutes left. Is there anything anyone would like to share in terms of, you know, lessons learned or, or some final thoughts on, on the project? I want to say that we're really grateful to the uh, government of Newfoundland Labrador, to the Immigration Population Growth and Skills for the startup funds because as a non-profit organization we we don't have co-funding so we only get um, funding when we have um, projects so we would not have been able to do the impactful gifts program if we didn't have that financial assistance and then of course we have never had a social enterprise in the life of the organization <laughs> so <laughs> to be able to have uh, Memorial University Center for Social Enterprise and Entrepreneurship uh, for their staff, the support, like just stepping in and helping us and helping us to even advertise with the, the work term students, help, helping us with uh, the MyTax subsidy that we received and um, the subsidy we received also for Emma. Um, so we'll be able to not only get it started, but sustain it actually, because even if we only had had one person help us with the business plan in the winter, um, if we didn't have Emma, we wouldn't have been able to actually get it off the ground. So we're really thankful to that. We're thankful also to our steering committee because um, I always feel that there's power in the voices around the table, around the screen, because for most of the time we were having <laughs> virtual meetings, but just being able to meet weekly, I really do appreciate the time that they gave to this. So we were able to meet weekly and brainstorm ideas, you know, talk about how things are going, support each other. I felt that the steering committee played a big role as well in, in how it, it was sort of just uh, came around and wrapped around the, the program, which was really lovely the way that uh, that happened. And of course, the community, we couldn't uh, forget that when we're down at the Kiribiti village, that many people came out to us and they were very kind to the students, listened to them, even though they know some of the students' English is an additional language for them, but they were so patient and waiting for them to explain what the bags were all about or watch them so um, when, when we were at the farmer's market. so. Uh, uh, overall, I really am just truly grateful for um, uh, the many, many hands and minds and brains and thoughts that, of people that came around to, 
to make this happen. And of course, over and above that, the students themselves, because it was the holiday time when we ran the summer program, but they came, went to, came on the bus and came with me nine o'clock to the Kiribidi village to sell the bags, <laughs> made so many bags. And uh, so we're really appreciative of them and their dedication and commitment to the program because they stayed and they assisted us. So I think all around everyone that had a part to play in it um, made it possible for what, we, what we're here today. So I thank everyone. <laughs> that's great, Lorda. I think that's those are some wonderful, wonderful final thoughts. And I think it's it's important to think about, you know, social enterprise and how they can um, create more sustainable futures for, for not-for-profit organizations. Um, and so I think for uh, Memorial University, it's really an interesting piece to have that Center for Social Enterprise and how that can support community organizations um, such as yours and how that how that looks going forward. I think that's that's really uh, an important collaboration um, that that'll be valuable um, as we go forward from COVID-19. Yeah. Sarah, anything you'd like to speak to there in terms of social enterprise and community collaboration? Yeah, I'd just like to quickly respond to Loretta and say that, you know, this partnership between the Center for Social Enterprise and Sharing Our Cultures is fantastic and we'd love to continue this partnership in the future and maybe even in more direct direct ways because right now I've, you know, I've been involved in helping place Emma, for example, but I never really saw Sharing Our Cultures or Impactful Gifts in action. And so just hearing everyone today and everything that's being listed, it's so exciting. And I'd love to be involved more somehow. Okay. Yeah, thank you. We're so thankful to Emma. She's so fantastic and such a great role model. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're really yeah, happy. <laughs> and I think it's wonderful that Emma has also been able to to keep her employment with your organization. I think that that's, you know, the, the benefits of this program just keep extending <laughs> for everyone involved that's that's wonderful so we have one minute to spare um, so I would really like to thank the organizers of this conference I think this is a great opportunity um, for individuals and and you know it's it's been a challenging couple of years with COVID but we are able to do this virtually um, across the corners of our country and I think that that's a really interesting opportunity for all of us to learn best practices and to learn about projects such as this and, and to share about them importantly for us in, in this session today. Um, so we thank those of you for listening and those of you who organized um, and for Sheldon for keeping us organized um, behind the scenes. Definitely he, uh, he kept, us, uh, kept us going. So thank you. And I thank you, Sarah and Emma and Yasmin, and of course, Lloyd Etta for, for your work you've done um, for the province for it's 22 years now since 1999. So thank you very much, everyone. And um, I hope you have a wonderful evening wherever you are and whatever time it is there. And uh, that's all from us here in Newfoundland Labrador. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.